together and God said, it's very good. So that's where it was in the beginning. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So let's talk for just a second about what that meant to be created in the image of God. First, it meant that you were perfect in body. That just sounds so good. The older I get, the better it sounds. It's always sounded good, but it sounds even better now, right? And uh, that's perfectly healthy. No disease, perfect form and shape, perfect athleticism, perfect physiology, and perfectly youthful. Bodies that would never age or wear out. What else does it mean to be created in the image of God? It means perfect in soul. Now your soul is the you who lives inside your body. Your soul includes not only your intellect, but your creativity. All of those uniquenesses that, that make you who you are, your personality, your, it includes your tastes and your desires and your affections and, and all of those things were created perfectly, okay? And to be perfect, your soul is alive physically with you here, but also eternally. It, it could be defined almost your soul as the place that you springs from, okay? That's your soul. The, the third thing that it means to be created in the image of God is we were created perfect in spirit. And sometimes people confuse soul and spirit. Uh, the spirit is the part of mankind that allows us to respond to the things of God, and to discern and to understand the things of God. The spirit allows us to know God and to worship him. And we were born, created, in the beginning, we were created perfectly spiritually alive. So what happened then? We just had Adam and Eve, and life was perfect, and the world was perfect. And then they broke it. Right? It was perfect. And then they just broke it, given the free choice of love and obedience to God, or, or simply distrust, really, and disobedience, that they just chose to defy God's instructions. And, and so in that moment, three kinds of death were ushered into Adam and Eve's life and into, and into all of our lives since. First was physical death. Though made perfectly never to age, their bodies began to age in that moment. Adam lived to be 930 years old. Okay, the world was still much more perfect, much less decay than we have today. But over the succeeding generations, we began to see those life bands getting shorter and shorter and shorter. When we come all the way down to the time of Abraham, he lived to be 175 years old. His wife was still so beautiful at age 100 that, that Abraham had her lie to the king of a foreign country and say, she's my sister, because he was afraid the king would kill him in order to be able to legally take his wife. Now that's at age 100. And then we come down, generations from there, we see Joseph who lived to be 110, which is about the top end, okay, for lifespan today. In fact, there's a time when the Lord said he wasn't going to contend with man forever, and from now on, his life shall be, I think he said 120 at that time, as a, as a top end uh, for, for the life for the life uh, span of mankind. And so uh, all of this happens, this physical death, in that moment in time with sin. But in addition to physical death, it also brought spiritual death. So no longer were we one in spirit with God. You know, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they walked with God in the Garden. They were one with Him in, in spirit. They, there, was this, there was this spiritual connectivity, this oneness, this unity. And now for the first time because of sin, there was this tangible gulf between them, a, 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 a spiritual wall because man was spiritually dead. There was spiritual death that happened immediately. Our, our hearts no longer beat as one with the, heart, with the heartbeat of God. And then finally sin brought eternal death. Not only were they spiritually dead for the moment, but that death would continue on for eternity. Sin changed the landscape. Thorns and thistles. Maybe you're not aware of that. They came after the fall. That everything changed it, with humanity, with sin. People began to lie and to cheat 
and to murder. And we begin to see the sins of lust and greed and the abuse of power. And, and everywhere we turn, it seems, all these centuries later, we see the same battles being waged. We see it in our homes, we see it at work, we see it in school, we see it in marriages, in companies, in communities, in our nation, between nations. It's no secret then that life is a battle. And as men and women loved by God, the question then becomes, well, if life is a battle, how do we win? How do we, how do we come out on top if, if, if indeed this is a battle? And, and so, so this is why it's so critical that we understand the battle, because there is a way to win. There's a sure path. There, there's a clear trail. There's a hundred percent certain road to victory. Uh, but, but what's it going to take? Well, God had a plan, and that plan is what brings us to our scripture today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 22, Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's the third book with red letters. So if you turn to Luke chapter 22... God had done the unthinkable, all right? He sent his son to earth in the womb of a virgin. His son, Jesus, lived a perfect, sinless life. He spent three years preaching, teaching, doing amazing miracles, literally turning the world upside down. And then he came to his final weekend. It, it was the time of year when Jews celebrated the Passover, all right? This came from when they were uh, in captivity in Egypt. And after all the plagues, and Pharaoh continued to refuse to allow them to leave, and the final plague was that the firstborn male, the firstborn son of every in every home in Egypt was going to die that night. God sent a, a destroying angel all through Egypt, and not a single firstborn son, and even the firstborn of the animals, they, they were all taken, they were killed that night. And God said to the Israelites, you go ahead and slaughter a lamb, and you wipe the blood of that up on the sides of your door and over the top of your, of your door. And you stay inside. And when the destroyer comes and sees the blood of the lamb, he will pass over. He will pass over this year of your home. And you will not, he won't come in. All right? And so your children will be spared. And then God told them, he said, forever now, forever, you are to remember this and celebrate the Passover. So now all these centuries later, Here's Jesus getting ready on that weekend to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. So in Luke 22, beginning with verse 14, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I am eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Now Jesus, more than any of us, understands the battle. And he was very clear about this, this specific teaching that, that winning the battle is going to cost you. And, and we really have to get that up front. Winning the battle is going to cost you. Right here, you know, on the night he was betrayed, he let the disciples know that the cost of victory was a sacrificed life. There's always a cost. There's always a cost. If you want to win in life, you have to figure out what's true, and then you need to dig in. Uh, some of you know I have a little bit of a background in wrestling and, and coaching, and, and uh, if you're familiar at all with wrestling in America, uh, one name stands above every other name. It's Dan Gable. Dan Gable, uh, between high school and college, he compiled a record of 181 wins and one loss. 
His only loss, in fact, was in the 